In this mini dock build series, I'm going to be discussing the details and the work that I went through to make up the uh, minigun project based on both the regular minigun that's seen in Terminator 2 and the future minigun that's seen in Terminator 3. After working to collect and gather up the materials I needed to start the project, I pretty much just started out laying out what I thought I would need for it. As usual, I did quite a lot of research before I started the project, and whilst there's loads of information on the regular minigun, there was very little information about the future version. While I'm not really a big fan of the Terminator 3 film, I did quite like the idea of that sort of handheld plasma cannon, and even though it was only on screen for a few seconds, I kind of liked the concept. I went back and got a few screen grabs from the Terminator 3 movie directly, but the version I ended up settling on was closer to the Hot Toys collectible version, which was included as an accessory with the Terminator figure. The principle of what I had in mind was essentially to take the rear element of the minigun and keep that as a fixed element and have it set up in such a way that the barrels could be exchanged and then be able to switch out the traditional version for the single barreled future version. The build basically started out with a number of different concentric sized pieces of tube. The pieces and sizes that I used weren't 100% accurate to the real version, but for the sake of what I was doing they were certainly close enough to get the look that I was going for. From there, any of the custom elements that I need will be sculpted up as individual pattern pieces that I can then cast in metal and add to the construction of it. As much as possible, I want to include as many working elements in this one as I can, and there's plenty of space inside the tubes to allow for battery elements and drive motors and all that sort of thing. I'm going to be setting it up so that the barrel spin in the traditional version, and there'll be a lighting effect set up in the future version. As I started laying out the materials for this project, I've uh, quickly come to the realisation that I'm going to have to start work on the barrel sections of it first, mainly because where the barrel attaches to the main assembly of the drive mechanism. So it's going to be a lot easier to work out if I've got a universal drive shaft that either one of the barrels can connect to, and it should just be a matter of sliding one off and sliding the other one back on to get that two-in-one idea working for me. Now that I've got the discs cut out, I've got to get them to the right size so it all starts fitting together properly. The ones you can see here are the three spaces, and I've just got them stacked up together so that all the holes perfectly align. Once I've got that done, I've bolted them together so that I can sand them back, and that gives me three pieces that are now completely identical. There's two versions of the cup type piece that I'm making here. One piece connects to the drive assembly and the other piece is a transition point between the two different sizes of barrels. The minigun is called a minigun because of the weapon that it was originally scaled down from. And whilst it's by no means small, it's certainly been shrunk down a lot in comparison to the original weapon that it was based on, hence the term mini. And you can certainly see the difference between the two of them when you have a look at the different ammunition that they use. Now that I've made up that cup type piece, I can start drilling out the necessary holes I need to accommodate both the drive barrel that runs down the centre, as well as the six outer barrels that make up the look of it. And again, I've got the three pieces stacked up there again and drilling them out so that the holes maintain the same position. Just a very quick alignment test to make sure that the spacing is right. One of the things I'm doing is a little bit different in that I'm actually making these parts up and press fitting them. So there's, you'll notice that there's no welds in here or any joinery of any kind and that's because I've been able to make this part up to such a neat fit that it jams inside that outer tube so tightly that it becomes a solid piece. And because there's going to be no mechanical stresses on the part, that's going to be more than enough tension in there to hold together when it comes to the full assembly of it. I've continued that theme across into how I'm assembling the barrel pieces. In the research I've done, I've seen a few people who have tried to make these out of PVC tube and things like that. And one of the problems they strike when they come to put the spacer pieces together with the tubes passing through each hole, they have a tendency to want to spiral and they end up crooked under the torque of the assembly spinning. So to get around that, I'm using the same principle of using a smaller tube to jam down inside the larger tube. And that is such a tight fit that it can't move. And then the holes that I've put in there are only large enough to accommodate the smaller tube. So that when they're actually assembled, it looks like a continuous piece that actually passes through the centre of it, but what it really is is that large piece with a small piece passing through like that, and then it's capped off there to finish that part of the barrel. You can see there that's not the right size, that's the next step down, but I thought I'd just give you a quick look at that before I put that last piece in, so you can see how I'm getting it all put together. Before I hammered these pieces together, the inner tube was slightly tapered at the end to make sure that the alignment would be right, and the tube was sanded overall to make sure that the friction fit became tighter the more it was hammered on.
For the last part in the forward series of barrels, I'm using a piece of thread bar that's just the right gauge to self-tap into the tube that's there. And I've made these holes a little bit smaller so that they tap through that hole as well. That will add a little bit of needed weight to the forward section of it. And threading that last rod on, rather than hammering it on, should make that final assembly a lot tighter as well. Now that I've got the assembly worked out for that front half, I'm just attaching the rear section of the barrels. And the tube that I'm using for that is a larger diameter, so they need to be attached to the ones at the front. The tape is just to hold everything at the right level so they can get them riveted into place. And then that collar piece will slide up and all those joints are hidden from view. Just using my calipers to make sure that the spacing is even all the way around. And then I'm just attaching that final piece so that it can't move around at all. This is what I'm going to be using as the central drive shaft that I was talking about earlier. So you can see the concept of how the barrels spin with a drill. So to give you an idea, it'll slide down the centre like that. In this instance it continues all the way through. Now that I've got that bit sorted, it's on to working out the next barrel. And once I've got both barrel pieces sorted out, I can then start working out the main drive mechanism in the body of the gun. So it's time to start working on the second barrel and there's quite a bit of complexity in this even though it looks relatively simple. As I said the version I've decided to work on is more closely based on the Hot Toys version. And there seems to be a little bit more reference material available for that as well. I'm cutting in 8 slices with a very small angle removed from each slice so that it produces the taper I need to get the effect that I'm looking for. The piece of tube that you can see there is the same size piece of tube that's going to run through the centre of it. And by holding the little piece of tube in place I can use the rubber mallet to put a slight bend in those cut pieces now so that it all starts to line up. I don't want the slices to be exposed so I'm going to be making up a secondary cone that covers them up. That will thicken it up and it will also mean that I only have to hide one joint instead of eight. There's eight pieces that go around the outside diameter of the barrel. My guess is that they're supposed to represent a heat sink, which would kind of make sense if there was a high temperature plasma bolt going through the barrel. Once I've got that cone piece anchored into place, I can start adding in the individual components around the outside, and that will hide that seam point and add a great deal more strength to it as they're added. So that's the front bit done and it's time to start working on the next. And there's eight of them on each section, so I'm going to need to make up 24 of them. The parts that are on the forwardmost section of the barrel taper down like the barrel itself so that the gap in between them remains parallel. The other spaces that are attached are just rectangular. Pretty much using the same sort of principle to get them attached. I was going to try and completely hide the joinery of these, but I found that once the screw heads have been cut off, it leaves behind a kind of flush rivet point that I quite like the look of anyway. I was out at my local metal recycler and I was lucky enough to find a bell housing that covered up a spindle that ran into a gearbox and based on the pictures I've been able to find it's very close to the right shot that I need for the rearmost part of the barrel where it attaches into the body of the gun. It's going to take quite a bit of cleaning up but it should still be a lot easier than having to cast apart from scratch. You can see there that I've press fit a disc of aluminium into the end of it. That'll give me a section now that I can drill out that'll accommodate the size of the barrel.
this project goes back to a time where I still didn't have a mill in my workshop so all these slots had to be cut in by hand uh, it took quite a bit of time but drilling them out and then cutting them out and then using a deburring tool I was able to get a pretty straight line with them and they ended up looking pretty good So now that I've got both barrels sorted out, I need to start working out where it's going to connect to in terms of the internal mechanism for the body. This is the drill that I'm going to be using for the internal working of it. It's only a 12 volt drill, but it's more than enough power to drive the spin of the barrels around. And because it's a 12 volt battery, it means any of the wiring that I need to do for the futuristic version will be able to tap straight into it without any wiring issues. It looks to me that the future version is a static piece so that the barrels themselves don't rotate at all. It will have some blue light that will protrude through those slots and I need to still make up some plastic inserts that will diffuse that coloured light up through the way I want it to. So at this stage what I'm thinking is that this one will be a static version and this one will be a moving version. And I'm thinking what I will have is on the body of the gun somewhere I'll have a small toggle switch that will switch it from lights to motion. So uh, it'll just be a matter of flipping the switch over if I want the lit up version or flipping the switch back if I want the rotating version. Getting the motor connected to this internal support piece shouldn't be any sort of problem, but what I do need to do is work out some sort of internal bracing for the motor, so when all this is pulled together and then reassembled in the assembly of it, that everything doesn't wobble and sort of carry on. I don't think I'm going to be keeping really any of the handle on this, so I need to work out a way of cutting all that back so that the battery can be reconfigured so that it can be recharged. I've got two ideas in mind for that. The rear part of the gun normally has the drive motor on the side here, and the internal part there is normally where all the mechanisms sit to actually load the ammunition. Because I don't need to worry about that, I'm going to use this section for the central drive section, so the drill effectively will actually be down in the centre there like that. And depending on how it all sort of comes together once this has all been pulled apart, uh, I'm thinking that this particular cylinder on this side will be where the batteries go, and it'll either have a plug-in charger directly in it to recharge the battery, or that section can come off to be recharged should I ever need to replace that battery. So effectively what I need to do now is to bring this piece up to the same size diameter as this piece, and then that will give me two connecting elements that will end up the same so that when they're attached to the rear part of the gun, it really is just a matter of sliding this one off and sliding the other one on to get the lock I'm going for. I just thought I'd quickly insert some of the plastic that I'm using as a diffuser for the light just to give you a quick look at what that section will look like once it's lit up with the blue light. The future version of the minigun would probably be better described as a plasma cannon, known as the General Dynamics RBS-80, firing a plasma bolt at 160 watts in comparison to the 40 watts of the rifle and a variation of it was actually seen in the first film. It's not very well seen in the shots in which it's portrayed, but there's a couple of scenes where it's shown in use, one where it's mounted on the roof of the car, and the other scene is where the Terminator attacks the underground base. In both these instances though, the real world weapon that they were really using was a Browning machine gun, and a third film, it was purely done as a CGI creation. Stan Winston's studio was brought in again to do most of the practical effects for the third film and Industrial Light and Magic handled most of the CGI stuff. One of the other characters from the third film that I did like was the Grandfather Terminator, the Terminator 1 version that they came up with and once again these were done as practical effects and they created a number of real robotic characters that could be operated via remote control and also had the minigun incorporated into it as its primary weapons. And regardless of how I feel about the film in general I don't think anybody could fold these particular types of practical effects that were used in the film. Okay, I'm ready to start working out where the mounting is going to go for the internal motor and structure as well now but I thought I'd just quickly show what I've done here on the end. 
Uh, that's a series of uh, concentric rings that I've made up out of the different sizes of metal, except for two bits, which is on the inside and the outside, which are the rolled over edges of an old aluminium fry pan. If I slide that one off, you can see what that is. That one I've rounded to the inside, and the other one I've obviously rounded the other way around. That is the way that it normally appears on the fry pan, and that one effectively has been turned inside out. And that will be the last trim piece that I'll mount on there like that. It just pretties up that outside edge and makes that look a little bit more like there's a bearing structure inside there where the barrels would normally be driven. So there's a little compliance number there that actually tells me that that is directly 12 volts. I thought that there might be a little voltage regulator there, but it doesn't look like it is. I think what it is is a step regulator so that it actually can go through varying degrees of speed when the, when the trigger is pushed. So what I'm hoping is I'll be able to isolate them all together and remove that system completely and run it directly off the battery. For what I'm doing, I don't need it to be spinning at a varied speed. So it, with what I'm doing, it's either off or on. It's either spinning or it's not. So from the point of view of what I'm talking about testing out, uh, that's the first thing I'm going to do and see if I can isolate that directly to the battery and just see if that spins at full power. So looks like it's going to be pretty straightforward. I need a much longer wiring system than I've currently got there. But quite literally all I've got at the moment is the positive wire and the negative wire. And you can see that that just powers the drill directly. And eliminating that trigger has just simply removed the variable aspect of the drill, which I don't need anyway. So. Now it's a matter of uh, wrapping this up and getting a bit better insulation on it, uh, working out a longer extension system for the wiring and working out an internal mounting system for both the battery and the uh, motor itself. I've been able to disassemble the charge pack as well, uh, which just has a plug-in for the DC power block. That little circuit board has also got a little indicator light that tells me when the battery's fully charged and I'm pretty sure that if I extend those wires and attach them directly into the system, I should be able to incorporate that plug system into the body of the gun somewhere so that that both gives me an indicator light to let me know when the battery's fully charged and somewhere to charge it from. Okay, so I've got more cable there than I'm likely to need at this stage, but I can, I can either cut that off if I need to or wind it up and jam it inside. There's loads of room available to me. Uh, the battery pack obviously has to be insulated because it can't touch against the metal surface inside the gun, it'll just earth out. I've taken two cables off there, both as power and for the charge system is the orange cable that forks off there along with the black one. They both go back to the battery and can be positioned wherever I need them to be on that little circuit board there. From there I've got the single negative cable and two positive cables. One will power the drive motor for the barrels and the other one will power the lights for the futuristic version. So that's pretty much that sorted out. I can now set that aside and work out the mounting mechanisms. The details across the surface that I'm working on are pretty much just to match in with the look of it and for the sake of what I'm doing, the surface features that I'm laying down are purely ornamental. Okay, now that I've worked out pretty much where the accessory elements of the rear part of the gun are going to be mounted, I can start working on the internal mounting for the motor. The first thing I had to do, obviously, was to make sure that all the screws that went through were sort of cut off so that that interior bore section is completely smooth. From there, you can see in the bottom there, there's a, a wooden sleeve that I've just made up as a temporary piece for where the support barrel sort of comes out. And I've done a similar thing with the actual motor assembly itself where I've got a larger and a smaller sleeve that just holds the motor in the centre line position so that everything lines up when the barrel comes out the other end. And that simply just slides down into the centre like that. Uh, where it's actually going to be mounted is around about in that sort of position. And whilst that gap is a bit large at the moment, that's where the wiring will come out and run back to the battery and up to the trigger component on the handle of the gun.
The biggest concern I've got with it at the moment is whether or not the motor itself will be powerful enough to drive the barrels once they're all attached. And unfortunately, I'm not really going to know whether or not that's the case until I know whether or not that's the case. My original plan for it was to just use a Teflon sleeve bearing, but I found the weight of the support barrel that I want to use is still too much for it. But unfortunately, there's just too much of a leverage point on just that one area for it to support that full length of barrel without it sort of de developing a wobble uh, in the end of it. So to get around that, what I'm going to do is dispense with that sort of idea and go back to a more traditional sort of bearing setup. And because I've got enough length in here to do it, I'm actually going to be setting up two bearings. Uh, one that's set forward and another one that's set a little bit closer towards the motor and that should take out any of the wobble factor that's been created by the excessive leverage on the end of the barrel. So now that I've got the motor centered up and given one of the next things I need to do is to be firing up the furnace, I'm going to start working out all the wooden pattern pieces that I need uh, for all the fancy elements and all the mounting pieces that I need on it so that I can get all that casting done in one go. So that's pretty much all the pattern pieces made up now. Uh, I need to go through and give them a final check as far as detailing is concerned. And once that's done, I'm going to give them a coat of paint so that they're completely sealed so that the wet sand doesn't stick to them at all. I've only made one of those because it's repeated on either side. So I'll just use that as a duplicate and do one on one side and one on the other. Now that I've got the pattern pieces patched and painted, I'm ready to actually start casting them. The parts themselves are relatively straightforward and I'm just using the same technique that I normally use when it comes to doing the sand casting. I've decided I'm going to start working on it one side at a time so I can get each piece finished and then move on to the other side. The piece that I've got here is just a little bit heavy so I'm just drawing out the centre a little bit to cut down some of the weight. I'll probably do a little bit more to pretty this up once I'm getting closer to finishing. But it's not like it's going to be seen anyway and it's really just about making it a little bit lighter. From there it's just a matter of getting it all cleaned up and filed and sanded back and ready for polishing. The section that I'm working on at the moment is the part where I'm going to be storing the battery. So now that I've got the basic clean up done, I'm going to start working on a caddy for the battery to be held in place. The bit that I'm putting on here now is a stopper plate just to stop it sliding all the way through.
I'm just tapping the holes now so that I can add in some thread bar and that thread bar will actually tie it all together into one piece. Now that those parts all fit together properly, it's ready for final cleanup and polishing. But before I do that, I want to work out where the wiring is actually going to be mounted. I want to be able to plug the DC charger into it and I'm using the little power board that I disassembled from the charger that I've already gone ahead and drilled out some holes and squared off one of them so that the charge port will pass through it. The only problem with it is that the little indicator light is in the wrong position in relation to where I want it to be seen. So rather than rewiring it and moving it across into a different position, I've got a few pieces of perspex that's quite thick and I've decided to make up a little periscopic light diverter for it. And that just fits over the existing LED and with the 45 degree angle that I've got cut on the back there, it reflects the light through the perspex and shines it out into a position where I can see it when I plug in the charger. And then once it's painted black and mounted into position, you can see I've polished a bit of a lens shape into the bit that pokes through the metal. And you can see when the charger's plugged in there, it glows pretty brightly. Now that I know that that's going to work okay, I'm not terribly happy with having the holes exposed there, so I'm going to make up a cover plate for it. And to do that, what I've done is countersink two little neodymium magnets into it, and I've made up a cover plate that's got some corresponding magnets in it. Um, to make sure that it aligns properly, uh, it's slightly above the center line in the, the actual position of it. And I've set the magnets in so that they're polar opposite. So one is negative and one is positive, so that they can't be put on backwards. Which means when you put that little cover plate on, it auto aligns, so you don't have to worry about it matching up properly. And it snaps into position quite solidly. I can take it off and use the bolt that's next to it there to attach it to temporarily, whilst I charge up the system. And then once everything's charged up, it's just a matter of putting that plate back on and everything locks into place and hides those holes quite nicely. There's two primary parts that I had to cast up to get this piece made. Because the shape of them is a little bit fiddly, I had to spend quite a bit of time cleaning them up. My initial plan was to include the plating detail in the casting itself, but I found doing these plate pieces separately made the casts a little easier to make. And in the end, having them as a separate piece, I think, made them look more realistic anyway. The casting, cleanup, and assembly of these parts largely came down to getting the look of them right. Obviously, in the real version, these elements would have been gearboxes or motors or drive systems that would have gone into the real working of it. So I'm purely trying to get it to look right while still having enough room to get in the motors and batteries and stuff that I need for the construction of it myself. That's pretty much all the cast components done now. And now that I've got the basic shaping and cleanup done, I'll have to strip all these parts back down so that they can be individually polished and cleaned. But before I do that, I need to finish off the handle assembly. For the Y-shaped piece that runs across the top, I took a fairly thick piece of metal and cut a small V section out of it. And then I widened that V section out to the size that I needed. Once I had that piece shaped to the right size, I then put on a temporary handle. That Y-shaped piece of metal was also thick enough that I was able to tap holes into it without going all the way through. So I was able to mount the screws underneath so that they weren't exposed. This is the part where the pistol grip's mounted to. This is the forward handle piece that I've made up. It's based on the temporary handle that I initially used, but it's a little bit taller, and it has the hand grip shape built into it as well, and it's all been cast as one solid piece. That's the pistol grip piece now cleaned up, but before I can actually mount it onto the framework, I need to drill out a pathway for the wiring and the trigger assembly.
The large U-shaped piece here is the part that would normally support the gun if it was mounted onto a tripod, but it also connects the handle assembly to the two forward mounting points on the front of the gun. With all the bits together now I can do a real test on how it mounts to the body of the gun. There's a few areas I need to address. Now that all the parts are in their right place, I need to cut back the bolt so that they're not protruding into the inside where the motor is going to be. I also need to drill some holes into the battery section and work out where the cabling is going to go in relation to the trigger mechanism. The forward mounting pieces too are a little bit rough on the back and I just need to add a couple of little detail components to the back of those to make them look a bit nicer. But all in all, it's pretty much ready now for strip down and final cleanup. And apart from a few accessory components that I want to make up for it, it's getting pretty close to being in its finished state. I'm going to start working on some of the accessory elements as far as the gun's concerned. One of the things I want to have attached to it is a feeder belt. What I'm making up here is not super accurate in relation to the real world version. It's more just to represent the look that I'm going for. And being that I'm doing a two-in-one version, I like the idea that it's a little bit futuristic looking, but still looks like it may fit on the traditional version as well. So now that I've got the belt piece made up, I want to make up something for it to attach to. And for that, I want to make up a backpack ammo box. I found an old truck tie-down strap that I was able to chop up and start using for the mounting belt that's going to hold the box into place. And for the backpack itself, I was able to find a child carrier that had an aluminium frame, and it's a very similar configuration to what they use for the military backpacks like this. I don't have a heavy-duty sewing machine, so I'm heating up the end of a screwdriver and melting it through the strap material and then I'm using the handle of the screwdriver to push it down flat and form a seal, which actually makes for a really solid join once it's all complete. I'm just going to make up some custom buckle pieces so that I can loop it all together. The shoulder straps on the backpack were already black, but when I cut away the part where the child normally sits, there were still a couple of elements on it that were purple coloured, but I found giving it a hit with some black spray paint covered up that purple colour really well and blended it in perfectly well with the shoulder strap. The other thing that I've been able to reclaim is I've found some aluminium coated board. This is actually a board that's sandwiched together in such a way that it's got plastic in the middle of it and thin aluminium sheets on the outside surface of it. One side of it's powder coated with a particular colour but the other side's just the raw aluminium. Uh, it means the inside of the box I've created is sort of an hodgepodge of colours but it's not going to matter because the outside surface that I'm going for is that aluminium finish that I'm looking for anyway. The loop hinges were made out of parts that also came out of the backpack. The clamp down latches were also recycled off an old industrial potato peeler of all things and I've just used common rivets to build the box itself. So all the items have been through the barrel now and they're ready for the final polish. As I'm finishing off the polishing of the pieces, I'm also starting to reassemble them. I use two different types of switches for the pistol grip. One's just a standard momentary switch for the thumb position, 
but because the trigger is a custom made section, I had to use a little lever action micro switch behind the trigger so that I could get it to work properly. When I was doing the final polish on the different pieces, I tried to do them in such a way that there was a higher polish on some areas and a bit more of a satin finish on other areas. I just think it looks a little bit nicer and it gives a bit more of the illusion that there's more than one type of metal in use. Now that all the parts are pretty well back together and sorted out, I can start finalising the wiring. The industrial cable that I'm using here is overkill for what's really needed. So part of the wiring that I'm doing is converting them down to a thinner wire so that they fit more easily up into the handle. I'm also converting them to the matching colours that I'm using so that when I get down to where they connect to the battery I know that each wire is going to correspond to the task that I've set aside for that colour. I'm just setting up a little temporary platform that I can use to rest the pistol grip piece on whilst I do all the soldering. Before I finalise all the wiring that runs back to the battery, I just do a quick test on both the triggers to make sure that they're working. So now that I've got everything in its proper place and it's all working, I can install the final bolt and I'm ready for the motor installation. With the central rod that I'm using to mount the barrels on, I need a solid piece of aluminium that, that perfectly fits the inside diameter of that tube and then extends out the back of the tube enough to correspond with the bearings that I've got for it so that it's then connected to the motor. And I don't have a metal working lathe, so to get around that issue, I have poured some molten aluminium down the end of that tube so that it forms a slug down the end. And I've cut off the length of piece that I need, and now I just need to knock that piece of aluminium out. You can see there where I've started, and that should give me the piece I need that has both a perfect match to the tube and to the bearings I'm attaching it to. And there we have it. Should be able to tap a thread into one end, and the other end should match up to the tube.